be to God Almighty for his sustenance, love, compassion, and protection towards us once again. Highly esteemed listeners, welcome to the Oracles of God radio broadcast, a biblical program that is run and sponsored by the Churches of Christ, which come your way every Wednesday on Radio Universe 105.7 FM. Shall we commit ourselves to the Almighty God? We bless your name, we adore you, O God. We thank you for your wonderful blessings, your grace, and your protection towards us. We know that it's by your grace that you are alive this day, not because of our righteousness. For you have imputed your righteousness, courtesy, the precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that is how we are who we are. We thank you for this brand new Wednesday. And we pray you continue to forgive us our sins we've committed against you in all forms, that we may be blemished before you as you look at us in the cross of Jesus Christ. Once again, we thank you for this opportunity you are calling us, O Lord, that we may hear your priceless oracles. We pray you speak through us and in it, and grant us hearts of understanding that we may be able to comprehend and the word may build us up in this world for your glory. Once again, we thank you for the life of the staff of Radio Universe, especially do we ask your grace and your guidance and protection for them as they continue to transmit your records and are retreated to your audience. Begin and end successfully with us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Highly esteemed listeners, we are still on our theme, Dead Preachers Preach Unto Us, as we're looking at the Old Testament prophets and how God dealt with them with his people so that we will learn lessons from them. As of last week, we ended with the book of Obadiah, where we realized how important it is for us not to sit on the fence, not to think that we are indifferent to situations, but act in such a way as God positioned us for a specific purpose. We learn that, for all you know, and it is true in the scriptures, we are at where we are because God positioned us there to do some good to somebody, to a society, to a group. We've been positioned specifically and strategically by God to perform certain function that will help somebody go to heaven. And it's important for us to realize that when we fail to do those things and we think, that we are indifferent, God will judge us as he removed Edom from its place as a nation for failing to perform the function or the purpose for which he was situated at where he was. Today we're continuing with the prophet Nahum. Nahum. And we're also going to look at lessons that we can draw from this prophet also. Distinguishedness the name Nahum is a shortened version of the name Nehemiah. Nehemiah. The literary style of the book of Nahum is poetic. It is poetic prophecy of the downfall of Nineveh, and thus the conclusion of the Assyrian Empire. And as usual, let us look at a little historical or social background. During the final years of the northern kingdom of Israel, 
Assyria became God's judgment by proxy of his people. God used the Assyrians to judge the northern kingdom. But now it was time for Assyria to be judged. Through Nahum, God pronounced the termination of this empire, which termination eventually came when the Babylonians, the Medes, and the Scythians formed an alliance and conquered Nineveh in 612 BC. Nahum had prophesied that Nineveh will fall at the city of No, Thebes, and Egypt, that the Assyrians themselves had overthrown in 663 BC. As they arrogantly assumed that it was by their power that they conquered the people of God, God used other nations to judge them. The Distinguishedness, contemporary with Jeremiah and Zephaniah, now who ministered the word of God during times of great international turmoil. The book was written somewhere between 663 and 612 BC. The wicked reign of King Manasseh of Judah ended in 641 BC. After Manasseh came Ammon, and then the good reign of Josiah in 639 to 608 BC. The Assyrian military behaved cruelly toward their enemies in order to terrorize their enemies into surrendering. In 722 to 721 BC, they conquered Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. In the same campaign, they took 40 cities of Judah. According to the records of King Zenatarib of Assyria, the Assyrian army took over 200,000 Israelites into captivity. These captives were sold to the general population of the country of Assyria in order to pay the wages of the soldiers. But that was in 72221 BC. It is now over 100 years later. Judgment time had arrived for Assyria. The sinlessness. The Assyrian records of archaeology depict captives being staked to the ground and skinned alive by the Assyrian soldiers in order to terrorize their enemies. The military was a cruel culture within itself, not unlike some of the descendants of the same people today who thrive on creating terror among their enemies through cruelty. The Assyrian soldiers took pride in the fact that they could terrorize a population by their cruelty. The more people they terrorized into surrendering, the more money they made when they sold their captives back home. The seriousness, this helps us understand why Nahum wrote with excitement concerning the fall of the Assyrian military. When King Zenitareb brought his soldiers up against Jerusalem during the days of Hezekiah, 185,000 of the cruel soldiers were judged and killed by God. The soldiers were judged for their cruelty of Judah's sister nation to the north, which the Assyrians had just overthrown. We do not judge the people of Assyria, therefore, by the cruelty of the Assyrian military. However, by the time judgment was pronounced through Nahum, it seemed that the general population had regressed into much of the moral degradation from which they had repented in the days of Jonah over 100 years before. The repentance of Jonah's ministry was only temporary, but it was sufficient in order to prepare the way for the thousands of Israelites who came their way as captives after the 72221 BC, defeat of the Northern Kingdom. But now who now speaks of the end of the nation of Assyria, which end will take place a little over 100 years later in 612 BC. The final blow will be delivered in 605 at the Battle of Kachemik, in, in, as recorded in Jeremiah chapter 46, verse 2. Distinguished listeners, this is the historical background of the book of Nahum, and therefore that of Assyria, as at that, that time. Now let's look at how Nahum preaches to us. What lessons are we drawing from the book of Nahum? 
distinguished listeners, both Nahum and Zephaniah prophesied of the end of Nineveh. In the first part of the book, Nahum paints a poetic picture of the majesty of God. The last half of the book is a graphic poetic picture of the overthrow of the Assyrians. In all the judgments that God made against the Assyrians, his judgment was justified on the basis of the statement. In Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 14, Nehemiah 1 14, when he said, I will make your grave, for you are vile, unquote. Yes, when cultures become vile, they lose their right to exist in the global community of nations. Therefore, in reference to God's just judgment of the Assyrians, Nahum preaches to us today the following lessons. Lesson number one. God's vengeance will come upon the wicked. God's vengeance will come upon the wicked. The serious listeners, those who will fight against God's people should memorize the beginning of Nahum's book concerning the outpouring of God's judgment against Assyria or Nineveh. And it reads, in Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 2, Nehemiah 1 2, it reads, God is jealous and the Lord revenges. The Lord revenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. Unquote. The same says, those who will terrorize God's people through cruelty need to be aware of the one who eventually terrorized them with just vengeance. At the end of national Israel and during the ministry of Jesus and the apostles, when the religious leaders of the nation had themselves digressed to using terror and threats against Jesus and his disciples, it was again a time for God's vengeance to be poured out. When Jesus spoke of the termination of the national Israel in AD 70, he said of the days in Luke chapter 21, verse 22, Luke 21, 22, and I quote, For these are the days of vengeance, unquote. The same lessness. They were days of vengeance on an apostate Israel who persecuted the new spiritual Israel of God, the church. God will use the Roman army to bring vengeance on those who persecuted the early disciples. And to the final end of national Israel, God reminded the early Christians to leave vengeance to him. In their desire to render vengeance to their persecutors, Paul reminded the persecuted Christians in Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Romans 12, 19 reads, Dearly beloved, do not take revenge. Do not take revenge. Instead, they were to give place to God's wrath, according to Romans chapter 12, verse 19. When considering whose responsibility it is to render vengeance on those who persecute the children of God, we must always remember that this is God's business. It is not the business of the people of God. So Paul reminded the Christians in Rome of what the Lord said. In Romans 12, 9, and repeated in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30, he said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord God Almighty. The same listeners. In the years to come, Rome would unleash cruel persecution against Christians. The persecution began with a personal vendetta that Nero unleashed against Christians during the 60s, but this will lead to the state persecution by Rome that will be terminated only by the Edict of Toleration at the beginning of the 4th century AD. Distinguished listeners, until the time when God determines that he should unleash his vengeance, persecuted Christians should do the following. Romans chapter 12, verse 20. Romans 12, 20, and I read, If your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Unquote. In other words, do not be overcome by evil, 
but overcome evil with good. Romans 12, 21. The selflessness. Christians must always remember what God included in the Sinai law that he gave to Israel. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 35, Deuteronomy 32, 35, it reads, To me belongs vengeance and retribution. To me belongs vengeance and retribution. Unquote. Therefore, we must remember that Jesus is coming in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8. 2 Thessalonians 1, 8. The serious listeners, God is storing up vengeance for the last day. Those who will lift their hand against God's people must remember that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31. Hebrews 10, 31. If one does fall into his hands, he will suffer the vengeance of eternal life, according to Jude, verse 7. The distinguished listeners, the tragedy of the story of Nineveh is that 150 years before Nahum, the city had repented as a result of the preaching of Jonah. At that time, the nation had a heart for God. The repentance of the Nineveh population took place during Jonah's ministry. But over 100 years later, the Assyrians had backslidden into the degradation they were in before the arrival of Jonah. In the prophecy of Nahum, it seems that after about 150 years, the majority of the Ninevites had digressed to a state of moral degradation that justified their termination as a nation in 612 BC. The stimulus God really takes vengeance. And so it is very important for us to note that it is not in our place to rain curses on our enemies. People we perceive as enemies, whether they are truly enemies or not, for only God sees everything and we easily rain curses on them. We call ourselves prophets, we call ourselves men and women of God, we call ourselves Christians, and we do hail insults and curses on our enemies, or perceived opponents or enemies. This is unchristian and ungodly. The Bible is clear that we should even pray for our enemies. We should pray for those who persecute and hate us. And this is clear, and there is no adulteration to this. Any man who calls himself a prophet, or any person who calls himself a, a person of God, should know this. In the first place, the Bible says that God says vengeance is his. Anyone who wants to take vengeance is struggling with God to take what belongs to him. He said, vengeance is mine. And therefore, when you think you would rather take vengeance on perceived enemies, then you are struggling with God to take what is his. And do you know what? Whenever you try to take what belongs to God, he will unleash his fury on, on you. And it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of God. Yes, vengeance is the Lord's because he knows the end from the beginning. And he is a just God who will execute just judgment on whoever he wants to do. For he knows whether the person will repent or not. At the time of Jonah, he knew the people would repent. But Jonah didn't know. And so he was furious that God did not destroy them. And that is why he had a long, more than 250 years time for them. God also knew that by them repenting, the Israelites that he was about to send there in terms of punishment will have peace. In fact, their persecution will reduce because the people will have known God. Yes, that is why he said vengeance is mine. God takes time before he executes his judgment. Because he will look at the end of the person who he knows that will not repent before he executes the judgment. Sometimes the judgment is a form of discipline. And so it is not the business of God's people whatsoever to think that they can take the place of God, raining abusive language, insults, 
curses on their perceived opponents or enemies. This is unequivocally stated in the word of God. Brethren, we should learn these principles of godlyhood and live right. For the Lord says that if your enemy is thirsty, give him or her water to drink. If he is hungry, give him or her food to eat. Continue to pray for your enemy that the Lord will change his mind and heart because it is God's wish that all of us will appear before him in heaven for the purpose for which he created us. As we are strangers on this planet Earth, we are journeying into heaven and it is God's wish that we hold our hands there and that what is not in our place to condemn people by curses unto them. Those people who call themselves men of God, ministers and preachers and whoever, who are beheaded insults of people they claim are witches and wizards or people they think are their members. So they claim, raining insults and destruction on them is unbiblical. Distinguishedness. We rather need to pray earnestly for everyone, including our enemies. So the Lord will change their minds. If should they not change, the Bible is saying that vengeance is the Lord. He is able to execute just judgment. When you even want to execute your judgment, you may not even do it right. You may either under-execute or over-execute. In fact, you will not be able to execute. And he knows how to do it justly. At the time, he knows the person will not repent. Like what he did to Pharaoh. This is the first lesson that we are drawing from the book of Nahum. Second lesson, the seriousness, is this. A just God must bring vengeance on the wicked. A just God must bring vengeance on the wicked. The seriousness. The righteous seek to live righteously before God. If God is to reward justly the righteous, then there must be punishment for the unrighteous. God will not be fair if he rewarded the unrighteous with the same reward with which he rewarded the righteous. The justice of God therefore stands on the fact that vengeance will eventually be poured out on the unrighteous. God is a just God. God is a just God. God is a just God. He is just because he will eventually pour out vengeance on the righteous. The same as listeners. 150 years before, a generation of Ninevites repented at the preaching of Jonah. But those who repented failed to pass on to their descendants a repentant heart. At the time of Obadiah's pronouncements, it was now time for the nation to reap the reward of unrighteousness. God had been merciful to Nineveh during the time he used them in proxy judgment upon the wickedness of the northern kingdom of Israel. However, the mercy and love suffering of the Lord had come to an end a little over 100 years after the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel, according to Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. It was now time for Assyria to suffer the vengeance of God. Vengeance is of the Lord, and he will eventually bring it to the wicked. That is another lesson. The third lesson we shall draw, lesson number three, is that God works among the nation. God works among the nations. The seriousness. The minor prophet Nahum reveals a major work of God among the nations of the world. We will conclude from the rise of the Assyrian Empire that it was a magnificent nation among the nations of the world. Assyria had conquered great nations throughout the Middle East, reaching as far south as Thebes in Egypt. From the Assyrian archaeological artifacts that have been preserved to this day, it was a nation that made its mark on history from Egypt to India. The seriousness. At the zenith of its power and domination of the Middle East, a lone man about whom we know nothing other than what we read in his book arises alone 
and pronounces the fall of the great Assyrian Empire. At the time Nahum wrote these words, the people surely mocked his statements concerning the fall of such a great empire. There were no hints in the Assyrian Empire of impending data. False prophets who base their predictions on current events, and that is prediction. They don't prophesy. They are all over the world and all over Ghana now. Predicting as they will cut lottery. And sometimes it, they think it may come to pass because they have hints. Prophet Nahum prophesied at the time the city was so great, there was never a little hint regarding it that fall. Most of the prophets, when they did prophesy, the people mocked because there were no hints that such a thing would happen. There were no hints in the Assyrian Empire of impending danger. But a true prophet was known by the fact that when he pronounced judgment against a particular nation, the nation itself was at the time of the prophecy often at the zenith of his power. The senselessness. What the people did not realize at the time of Nahum prophecy was that it was God who was working among the nations for the preservation of his people and evangelization of the world. And in order to accomplish this work, the Assyrian Empire had to go. It had to go in order to allow the rise of the Babylonian Empire. Hallelujah. We must see the 200,000 Israelites that Assyrians took into captivity at the fall of Samaria in 72221 BC as the beginning of an international network that God was setting up to take the name of his son into all the world. Hallelujah. The captive Israelites were sold throughout the Assyrian Empire. In their captivity, there was repentance on the part of Israel, but also they maintained their identity as the sons of Abraham until the time when God will bring only a remnant of their great, great grandchildren back to the land of promise. With the remnant of the captives of the Babylonian captivity, they too will return to Palestine as a remnant in 536 BC. The same During the Passover or Pentecost of AD 30, those of Israel who remained in the land of their captives would come as a remnant of all Israel to Jerusalem from as far south as Egypt and Ethiopia to as far east as India. And when the Messiah showed up in history, his gospel message will be carried back to Israelites in all these countries to where the initial captives had established themselves in anticipation of the coming Messiah. God was working among the nations during the ministry of the prophets, not simply to pronounce judgment upon those who fought against his people, but also to turn the work of Satan against himself for the salvation of people throughout the world. When we read of kingdoms as Assyria and Babylonia, therefore, we must understand that God was working among these nations in order to bring about the preaching of the gospel to the world. Distinguishedness. This has always been the norm and the style of God's reign. At any point in time, remember that God so handily created the world, heavens and earth and all the other planets. By his word that he spoke, everything was created. By using the dust of the earth, he created mankind. And from that, he instituted marriage through whom mankind is generated. So everything belongs to God. And all peoples belong to God. All nations belong to God. And in all the history and the looking at the style of God's reign, he reigns among the nations. Even at the time that the devil thought that he had deceived the entire world into idolatry in such a way that God could not even get anyone apart from uh, one, one man like Abraham and sometimes like Noah, still God was ruling among the nations. It's important for us to just understand, therefore, that today Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords, not only over the church, but over the whole world. It is the difference is just clear that the people of the church ob obediently and willingly bow down to him. 
but the people outside may not now, but they will definitely do one day, whether they like it or not. At that time, they will wish that they will have bowed down to him voluntarily. All those who will bow down to Jesus voluntarily shall inherit the heavenly kingdom. But all those who will bow down by force because they need to, but not voluntarily, will be assigned to hellfire. And that is why we are shouting on top of our voices this morning and every day that will you bow down to this Jesus voluntarily for God reigns among the nations. All nations belong to him. And every single thing that we do we shall give an account to ourselves. As presidents, as ministers, as people in ministries, as people whoever we find ourselves, nations of nations, shall give an account of how they dealt with God's creation. This is the listeners. It is important for us to understand this clear statement that God, when the days that we said the devil was ruling the nations, even that time it was not perfectly true. When Jesus Christ came, he took captivity captive. And so it is no longer easy to stand somewhere and say, oh, that is the devil who is ruling the world. He has been overcome. And God is reigning among the nations. His kingdom is over all. And a time will come that the disobedient subjects will bow down to him. For in every kingdom we have obedient subjects and disobedient subjects. The obedient, the church contains the obedient subjects. And outside is the disobedient subjects. But God reigns over all. Whether obedient or disobedience, through his providence, he is manipulating the system to finally come to a point that all those who want to believe him shall be saved. Just as a date during the day of Pentecost. Look at this hundreds and thousands of years prior to AD 13 Acts chapter 2. God was preparing a platform that he will send the message of his son throughout the world. And so he prepares nations like Assyria, Babylonian, and all that, scattered his people there because they were disobedient. And he turned the devil's mischief upon himself. So by Acts chapter 2, all those people that the Bible mentioned as coming to celebrate the Pentecost festival were such people that had been scattered, the remnant. And so you see that the message of God, the gospel, the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ came powerfully through Peter and that day 3,000 souls were added to the church. Those who therefore left went and spread throughout the world and so easily the message was able to reach the ends of the world. Who will be able to fight this Jehovah? Almighty God, omnipotent, omnipresent and omniscient God. He reigns among the nations. God reigns over the nations. We need to understand this. And therefore, we humble ourselves and worship him. It is also important for us to realize that it is not so easy to think that one saved forever safe. When God had mercy on the nation of Nineveh, and they, repent, they did not repent later, when generations after generations, they digress into sin, then God also brought vengeance on them. In every of nations that were established on the principles of God. We have great, great nations that were established, were, established, were established by the principles of God. In God we trust and so many other things. God bless the homeland Ghana and so many other things. That is not enough. If we fail to inculcate the worship of God in our generations, and the generations to come, so that our next generation will not follow God, then God will bring vengeance, judgment upon such nations. These are lessons that we are drawing from the book of Nahum. The same listeners. Today, this is what we have done. We have learned lessons from the book of Nahum, and we are saying Nahum preaches to us, telling us from his book that vengeance belongs to the Lord. And a just God must bring vengeance on the wicked. 
and God reigns over the nations. May the good Lord be with us as we imbibe these lessons that we will continue to live after him. For in him we live and move and have our being and we shall be blessed. God willing, next week we shall continue. Once again, this has been the Oracles of God radio broadcast, a biblical program that is run and sponsored by the Churches of Christ, which come your way every Wednesday, 5.30 a.m. Make a day with us, same time, God willing, next week, as God controls to unravel his priceless oracles. You are warmly invited to worship the Churches of Christ all over the country, the pillar of truth, where an adulterated word of God is shared, and God is worshipped in spirit and in truth. You may want to contact us on 024-552-7658 or send us a message on coc.radio at yahoo.com. We're also located on Facebook at Church Radio. Church Radio. Once again, I am your brother, Eric Dakon. Now may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify us through and through. May our spirit so somebody become blameless at the appearance of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Till we meet again. Stay richly blessed. Amen and good morning.